Music. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, Lorraine Turner, and her website is called Calico Horses. And when you visit calicohorses.com, you will know why she has that name. Lorraine, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here, Gary. Yeah, uh, really looking forward to uh, talking with you and, and really appreciate you making the time because um, uh, you don't fit any normal slot in the shelf. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but hopefully, oh it's no, good. it's it's quite good. It's quite good. The uh, in in my research early on, I don't know if it was in school or whatever, a teacher or somebody said you'll never be an artist, mm-hmm. and. My yeah. my reaction was what was your well my reaction was or thought was what did that do to you did that put you put a chip on your shoulder or did you just let it roll off your back? No, it was at sixteen and I was looking to go to college and I knew I wanted to be an artist and I thought you needed I thought you needed a piece of paper I really did I thought you had to have that document to say this is what you know this is an artist. Yeah. And I was told I wasn't good enough. I was told I wasn't good enough and I I believed it. I I wore it. And I was, uh, it took me 16 years later as an adult single mom with two kids to travel 180 miles round trip to Philadelphia Art Institute to uh, follow that dream. So that, okay, as a former teacher, see, I would never say that. Uh, Okay. Because you you don't do that to kids because you never know. Yeah. I mean, that's, you just don't. And so, so that one hit you, that, that cut deep. That was gut wrenching. Yeah. It was gut wrenching. Yeah. But you, but you stuck it out. So you had it in you, you had it in you and you weren't giving it up. No, I was, I, it's a, you know, it's that inner core. It's believing in yourself. I knew I, I mean, I was drawing, but probably before I could walk, walk, you know, I just always wanted to do something with my art. And when I was told I couldn't make it by somebody of authority, um, I believed it, and it took me a, you know it took me a while to a little maturity, little uh, bumps in the roads in life, and I was able to uh, find my way to the art school. And then, and then you never gave it up. That's great. <laughs> no, I graduated from uh, Art Institute of Philadelphia, and I was picked up by the Philadelphia 76ers and became their lead designer. And I worked with them for ten years in the NBA, and I, <laughs> I won two Emmys for my work. Well. That that ought to prove the point. <laughs> <laughs> so I made it. I made it. You know, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> what's that like? What's that like? Uh, I had not planned to talk about the seventy sixers, but let's talk about the seventy sixers. What's that like working in that environment? Is is it high pressure, or did you have? Uh, were you able to be creative? Well, the fun part about it, Gary, is that I lived in South Jersey, and I did not have to go into the office of Philadelphia seventy sixers. Oh. They hired me. I worked out of my home. I was raising kids. I worked out of my home, but I, the felt, you know, I work. It felt like twenty four seven. I remember one time I was going on vacation in the Bahamas, and I got a call from the Sixers, and they were like, "Rain, we need a brochure. We need." And they're naming all these things to do. And I said, I- "I'm going on vacation. I'm leaving." And they're like, "Hire." I said, "I haven't even packed yet." And they're like, "Hire somebody to pack." <laughs> but I did. I had the best time, Gary. They. I was, the, you know, they pulled in this artist to work in the stands drawing uh, signs for kids, paying me top dollar, and my kids got to sit in club box seats. I mean, it was, oh, okay. it was a great gig. Tell, I'll tell you. Okay, all right. That's, I guess that's what I really wanted to know. Is, was it a good gig? And it sounds like it, it was. was. Good, yeah. good ride, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Because, yeah, you know, those kinds of corporate cultures can be just stifling and... Uh, well, know, I'll give you an, I, an idea. Um, I, there's like 20,000 people in the stands, and I worked on one of the videos that's supposed to get the crowd rocking, you know? Yeah. And I remember making this video, and the crowd went crazy on it. And the, the guy that hired me, my boss, texts me, and he says, this is your payday. And it's true. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I got to watch the reaction. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was great. Worth everything, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah everything. That's great. Yeah. So, all right. So you have a good gig there, but tell, tell the story now today, your work as a textile artist, and Mm -hmm. and we'll get to that because it's, it's fascinating in its own right. But what switches you to what you're doing today, which is basically creating art to raise awareness and raise funds Mm -hmm. to protect endangered animals. What, Mm -hmm. what, what turns that from the 76ers to protecting animals? Yep. Yep. (laughs) 
So that's a good question. So I quit a high paying job in 2007 and traveled, I think it's 1800 miles to the middle of no, well, it's like another planet, Key West, Florida. I knew <laughs> no one. I knew I needed to get away. I was in a toxic relationship, Gary. I was, I needed to move on. Yeah. And so I did this. I knew no one. I got a job and a room on Craigslist. I it was, like I said, I knew nobody. I was making, you know, I went from what? $80 an hour to $9 an hour that quick. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm pulling stuff out of the trash. I packed every summer clothes I had and I drove to Key West because somebody said, Lorraine, there's a job here. And I didn't realize when I got there that, I mean, wow, big, big change from corporate world to just, you know, drawing mag margaritas and parrots and sunsets, you know, <laughs> t-shirts. <laughs> it was a tough life. But I started meditating because I picked up so much work to try to make it. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to build a career here. They don't know me. I'm I'm a stranger from you know South Jersey, and so as I'm finding that I'm having a hard time uh, adjusting to all of that, I started meditating. And I, m meditation for me was is just go into silence and stop thinking. I needed to teach myself to stop thinking because, as you can imagine, I was going through a lot at the time. Mm -hmm. And as I started meditating. Strange as it sounds, I started seeing images of animals that were coming to me, and I didn't know what the heck I was looking at, but I know that they were, it was strong enough, the image, imagery was strong enough for me to pick up the phone and call somebody about the images that I was seeing, and it was wild horses being rounded up in Nevada, and I, I thought, Gary, I lived in flip-flops and palm trees. I didn't even know they had wild horses. I thought that was something from the, you know, <laughs> the Western movies. I didn't know about this stuff. So when I interviewed the person, she said, oh, how soon can you be here? And it was like, I don't know, Sunday. She's, I said, oh, I can be there like Thursday. And she's like, all right. So I flew out there and interviewed them. And that's really how it became me getting started with um, connecting with animals and working to help the animals that are struggling for survival. So um, and so back up to the meditation. Mm -hmm. So so you're, you're just stressed out. You leave town. You got to get away from yep. everything. And right. So what turns you to the meditation part? Is is it literally, I need to stop the, wor the whirlwind? I just need to stop it. Well, as a designer, you're constantly, and when you're a freelancer, you're working from everybody. I work from everybody from Comcast to Dairy Queen. So mm -hmm. I'm picking up work from everybody. And I'm juggling a lot of different art projects. And when you're, and you're dealing with that much creativity in your head, it, you, 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 I mean, I, was, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. It was becoming... Oh. Know, I needed to survive. So I decided to teach myself how to not think. And basically what it was, was it started out, you know, a couple minutes a day, and then I built it up to 15 minutes a day. And I was able to stop thinking. Now, what that did was it brought in elements of creativity. Yeah. <laughs> not, not about the project I'm working on, you know, not, not the uh, margarita t-shirt, but other things that would come in that were just like, wow. I don't... And you know what was really cool about it? It was done in my hand, and I had never done it before. So I'm seeing imagery. Almost <laughs> like, it's almost like your subconscious is bringing you images saying, you can do this, Lorraine. You can... Just try it. Just try it. <laughs> so so you, were, you were getting on a grander scale what happens to all of us in the middle of the night or while we're taking a shower. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you, found, you found that, but on a much bigger scale. I did. I found that. And it's uh, now that I've looked into it, because I didn't know what it was, it's called alpha state. It's daydreaming state. It's the it's the state when you tell your kid to take the trash out and the kid is zoned into something. And all of a sudden you say ice cream and they turn their head. Uh -huh. it's, they're zoned out. That's alpha state. They're just daydreaming. They're just totally in another state. And that's what that's what you try to do in meditation. You don't try to fall asleep. That's a nap. You try to get to a space where you're not thinking of anything and creative images for me, Gary, um, to this day, all of the art that you see is all brought by meditation. All comes from that. And so, so there was no formal Buddhist temple training no. with mantras and all that. Uh, <laughs> none of that. <laughs> well, I looked at YouTube and I, and I read. Yeah, and I of course you did. <laughs> What happens is they were having all these supernatural experiences. I'm like, where, where's my supernatural? I'm, I'm not getting anything. I'm hearing the dog bark. I'm hearing the trash truck. You know, I'm not able to tune out. And so I realized that I needed to forget everything I read and saw and stop. It was the doing. It was that was the interfering part. I didn't need to light a candle and sit in a different seat. I needed to just 
get comfortable and stop thinking. And that's what I did. And I teach people. I've taught people ages eight and up how to do this. Everybody can do it. Everybody can do it. Well, see, all right. So that helps me a lot because in, in my studies of you, that mm -hmm. you keep repeating that everybody can do this. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, no, everybody can't because don't you have to have some training and sit in the lotus position and, and blah, blah, blah. But I can no. see how I can see how all of us have done it. And mm -hmm. if you actually focus on it the way you describe it, how you can actually achieve it, that's not uh, particularly difficult with some effort there. And think of it, Gary, think of it. I mean, look at the world we're living in right now. I'm teaching people how to unplug. We're living in the world of right. devices here. There's a lot of chatter and noise. When I tell them they have to turn off Facebook, it's like, oh, I can't do that. But that's how you're going to achieve that inner peace and to find your bliss. That's the name of the book, Follow Your Bliss. So it, it's, the, it's the one thing to do. And when I ask people to start learning how to do this, I'm talking about try it a minute, just a minute a day. Right. You know, yeah. and build up. Just have that moment, that moment yeah. where you're, you're released. You know what? Because you're worth it. You're worth it. You're worthy. That's why. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, so these things are coming to you, and you'd never heard of wild horses. East, never. East Coast people, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they exist. Um, so, you, so you flew to Nevada. This, so this was a job out there? No, I just, I had saw, I saw this. I didn't realize they were wild horse advocates, but I saw this woman and let's just back it up a little bit. I decided through the meditation, they were, I was given so much imagery that it looked like, um, a, you know, to me, it was like a great children's story. And so I started to, I started to put thoughts in my head that I'm going to write a book about the horses that are being ripped away from their families on the range to the children of separation and divorce. And I, and I saw that there was hope at the end of the tunnel and I wanted to bring that story. So I'm doing my research and I'm looking at this woman and she did uh, wild horse photography and I called her and she said, you know, she's the one said, come on out, I'll show you. So mm. when I went out there, I realized that the government and the government does, this, we have holding pens for horses that are rounded up. And I wanted to, I'm, I'm not going to tell the kids one side of the story. I'm telling both sides of the story. So I said, well, I need to speak to someone that's, you know, on both sides. I know you have all your wild horse people that say save the horses, but what is, what, what is the other story? So she said, they'll never talk to you. They won't speak to you. So I go and I drive out to this place where the government is and I go and I've left like three messages and no, no one won't return a call. So I go in there and I, and I walk in the door and she says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I flew from Florida. I want, I'm writing a book. I'm an author. I'm trying to do a story. And I'd like to know the other side of the story on these wild horses. And she says, well, I'm sorry. He's very busy. And I said, look, I'm just trying to write a kid's book. And the guy steps out and he says, can I help you? I said, yeah, can you help me? I need to find the other part of the story. And he says, yeah, come on in. So I go in there and like 35 minutes later, 40 minutes later, I get this huge interview from the guy. And I said, think of two 10 year old kids on a bed discussing the story. What story do you want them to hear? One sided yep. or both? And he gave me a great interview and I made him one of the characters in the book. So <laughs> Excellent. That's, a, that's why when you look at my website, calicohorses.com, it all really began because wild horses came to me. I believe they needed to have their message told. And to this day, if you really look at my website, you'll see that I predominantly do a lot of horses, and I help um, the sanctuary. So these horses are still rounded up, and they have to go somewhere. And I, my, the funds go to support uh, organizations that are wild horse sanctuaries, like returntofreedom.org. That's one of them. So all right, before we get to your art... Help me because I, I I I love nature, so I got to know. Tell the story about what's happening with these wild horses. They get uh, corralled, captured, and then mm -hmm. uh, the effort is to release them to other lands where they can still run free. Or what? Uh, what is the That's story? That's a fairy tale. That's a very nice thought, but that's Thank not you. what's happening. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, in the country, in our country, there's going to always be a struggle over land rights for mineral rights. That's mining for cattle's range. Um, and so there's always this uh, distribution over land. And so our government has, a, in, through the Interior Department of Interior, they, they govern that. They manage that. And one of the things they have to manage is wild horses. Now, for whatever reason, they have decided that wild horses are, don't fall under wildlife. They're their own section. And that's 
very bureaucratic, but that's what's going on. So what happens is the government goes in and says, okay, we got this many horses. We can tell by looking, uh, I don't know, a satellite. I don't know what they're, I don't even know what they're using, but we need to get rid of these horses. So they send in helicopters, teams of helicopters, and they round them up into a chute, and then they put them into these holding areas. And this country basically warehouses horses on taxpayer dollars. And they're supposed to go to adoption. But you tell me, Gary, how many people can adopt a wild Mustang? Not <laughs> yeah, many, yeah. Not that's, many. A, that's a short list. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we're, it's illegal to uh, sell them for human consumption. But, you know, wink, wink, look the other way. That's what's going on. So that's the story. And I don't tell children that. And I, 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 I do a lot of uh, speaking with uh, motivational speaking, helping children understand, but I'm just trying to show them that there is hope. I try to show them the positive parts of this um, and that we do have sanctuaries that are able to take care of these horses and put them on beautiful range lands. And, um, but, you know, that's, that's where my heart and my focus is. I'm not, I'm going to, I'm always going to go for the glass half full and I'm looking at the positive part of what, I know what the problem is. Let's talk about some answers. You know, let's mm -hmm. find some solutions, and uh, that's the best I can do. As you know, as far as a motivational speaker. Yeah. Well, so there is there is effort then. There is effort yeah, being effort. made. Yeah. There's effort. Yep. Yeah. And and uh, people can support that if they want. Yes. True. True. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, just you know, I, uh, rounding up wild horses. Let them run. What are they hurting? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I agree. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't quite get that, but whatever. Um, just because you think you can put a saddle on them doesn't mean you got to round them up. Um, yeah, yeah. Jeez. Uh, um, okay. So these, so the visions are of these horses. So that you're, you're, you teach yourself to just stop thinking. Horses come to mind. You're an artist. You go out there. You learn the story. You write a book. All right, when, when does this this textile but here, art? But here's the you're missing a spot and I didn't tell okay. you this. as I'm looking at the visions and this is this part really blows my mind as I'm looking at these visions and this took one over months in my meditation room I not only saw wild horses but they were clothed in calico fabrics no so the mountains the trees the rivers everything I'd never done a fabric collage in my life and I'm seeing all of these galloping running wild horses covered in fabric and the last meditation I was given but that that's what ended up the cover of my book was these three mustangs pawing and and they were they were real live horses but they were covered in calico fabric and so that's what the name is calico horses I mean unbelievable that this hat will get chills but that's where this all started Gary and so I was like what is with calico horses well they came from calico mountains Nevada it was the worst botched roundup in the history of this country and it had just happened six months prior to me getting these in meditation oh so, this is, wait this is just too creepy all of that creepy, and, I know but oh. it's exactly what happened and so I never I never did a fabric collage. Fabric collage didn't come until much later. Okay, this is 2011. My book book was published in 2000. Yeah, like 2011, something like that. So that's a lot so earlier than fabric collage, but it was there. As a matter of fact, I almost changed the name of my website, and then all of a sudden I started doing these fabric collage. My husband said, "It's a good thing you didn't change." <laughs> Yeah, that's that is the backstory to this. That really is a story. Oh, that's too much. That's too much. Yeah. And then, yeah. then somewhere in here, you learn to connect with animals. Tell mm -hmm. them, tell that part of it too, because this is well, this is what I mean about. It took me a while just to get my head wrapped around you. <laughs> well, I know all of you are tuning in to listen about fiber and all of that. We'll get there. I, but there, this is a creative part of this that's a core and it's the heart of my work, and that's to help the endangered animals. Now, how does that happen? Well, during this time of helping wild horses, not only horses started to come to me, other animals started to come to me to the point where I figured I better figure out they're talking to me and are they what am i supposed to what is all this why are they telling me all this why am i seeing this and hearing this and so i enrolled i did a little bit of research and there's a lot of great animal communicators from um, people that do tracking animals and all of that um and one of them was in south africa now she's a long way away but she taught me how to do this through an internet i learned with photographs only how to connect with animals and 
and I was very accurate in what they were saying back to me. And it starts out very simple. What is your favorite food? Where do you like to sleep? Uh, tell me what your, you know, show me your, I was a big one, show me your body on mine. And I could feel in my body different areas that needed attention, the medical, you know, the sore arm, whatever. Now, this isn't pet psychic stuff. This is energy work, Gary. It's basically you use your heart energy to connect to the animal. So my heart energy was already working through the meditation. I was reaching a, a, an area that was climbing pretty high. And when I talked to my teacher about it, she said, you're the first person I've ever certified so quickly because I believe it's because of meditation. You mm -hmm. have connected so easily with animals because of meditation. So here I am, I'm connected with animals. Now I'm a professional animal communicator and I'm helping people with their cats and their dogs and their runaway pets and all that. And I get a phone call. This is October, 2015. Lorraine, we have some app, we have some lions that need some help. We have a team of communicators that's going to speak with them because um, they're in trouble. Can you come? And I was like, well, you know, I've been donating my art to the whitelions.org because I had started to branch out to other organizations, my art. And at this time, Gary, I'm just doing felting and, and little, you know, simple things. And so she says, well, how soon, another one of those, how soon can you be here? I'm like, well, when do you need me? She said, Thursday. It's like Sunday. I'm like, okay, I'm going to South <laughs> Africa, 16 hour flight, you know. I get there, I go to meet the lions in the organization called whitelions.org. And while I'm there, I'm communicating with other communicators and we're finding out that, you know, one of the lions stopped eating because her brother in the, the range next door had been, it's a game, that one was a game preserve. So over there, the lions get canned hunting and on this preserve, they get saved. So what are you going to do with that? You got this. So what happened basically is her brother was killed in the, uh, in the game preserve and she went off for food and she was acting, you know, violent to the other animals. And so they brought us in as a team. So that's all great. So I'm over there talking to animals and I'm just about to leave. And they're like, well, we're going to go meet the, the, the head lion. There's always like the head dude and the lion. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm, I'm going to do this. And so we go in a Jeep and they take us out and he's laying in this big area. And I start to meditate him. And my teacher has always taught us, you know, just don't, don't go there with any expectations. Just keep a blank mind. And if they, if the animal's going to talk to you, you're going to know it. Now, let me, so, let me understand. This is not a zoo setting. This is a no, literal wild a, animal setting. This is, there's no such thing. And that's something that most people don't understand, but there's no such thing as wild animals in Africa anymore. They are all in preserves. They are in game preserves or they're in like the Kruger national park. They're in protected areas or they're in the hunting area. Cause that is acceptable and perfectly fine. And that, that's that's the way their government allows it because that brings in income. So you you know that's why the dentist shot the lion Cecil whatever that right. that's one of those sorts. So I'm over there just trying to help. You know I'm with a team of people. I'm Gary. I am not expecting this lion to tell me anything about my life. I'm just there. You know I'm with a group, and this lion, his name is uh, Ma Maya Myla. He showed me myself doing textile art, creating art with my hands. I know my work. I know, I'm an illustrator. I'm a professional illustrator. Seeing my work being used with fibers and threads, and then it comes, it says it, because it, when it works like this, it's like, think of it as telepathy. The messages are coming to you, and every single communicator gets it differently. So I get drop-down messages because I'm a graphic designer working on a computer. <laughs> I'll get a computer screen with drop-down messages. And one of the things he said was, um, you will be giving your art to, uh, for endangered animals, and, and you will never... Never, don't look at what's coming back. You can never outgive. That was the message. You can never outgive. You can never outgive. And I turned to the person that brought me in and I told her what he said. And she said, wait a second. Do you do, do you do textile art? I'm like, no. She said, are you going to do it? I said, I don't even know where to begin. I've never done this in my life. <laughs> that was October. And by spring of 2016, I started creating textile art with fibers and threads and everything went to whitelines.org. And I tell you, Gary, I don't have one piece left. Everything sold, everything. Mm. And I was, and that's really how my career began. I mean, if you look at my website, it's like, what's with all these lions? Just doing lions and horses. Because <laughs> they kept coming to me. You know, I'm drawing the visions that are coming to me. So that's why uh, people say, well, Lorraine, when are you going to do a raccoon? Well, when it comes and talks to me, we'll be doing <laughs> raccoons. But I haven't seen one yet. <laughs> now, you, you do realize that if a committee sat down while you were working with the 76ers, there's no way they come up with this path. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I don't think so. No, I, I, really I don't, don't think uh, I don't think that even could get cooked up. Yeah, even on heavy drugs. No. <laughs> I know. And, and you know what the difficult part is, is that when I give exhibitions and I'm explaining my, I mean, people, seriously, people have their mouths dropped open when I'm telling them, you know, about the art, how, the procedure and all that. But I always, I love this part when the exhibition is over and the talk is done. I always get the husbands and the guys that come up here and tell me they have a dog that they, that I need them to talk to. So I, can, <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that anymore. No, that was, no. yeah, I'll do that. Anymore. All right. So now with all this background, then you have no choice but to start doing textile art. I mean, it, you would not be true to yourself in any way, shape, or form if you didn't. No, but I found, because I'm also like, I'm, I like to research, and I've got a, I got a life, Gary, of other things I do. I have a little bit of research in me. I love Ancestry.com. And so through my research, I found out that, just bear with me, there's a, in 1867, a man named Carl Raithy immigrated to America from Alsace-Lorraine, France, where he goes to the Chicago um, Opera House and he's a tailor and he falls in love with a gown seamstress that does all the gowns for the opera stars. And they get married, move to Philadelphia, have five children. One of the women is Lena and she's an awning maker in Philadelphia. She does all these awnings and she's fantastic. She marries an inventor. They move to Atlantic City and have five children. One of them is an, an amazing upholsterer uh, without soft talk a pollster who marries a woman that does hand embroidery amazing embroidery they have eight kids and one of them is me so my <laughs> background whether i like it or not gary it's in the genes <laughs> yep yep you're locked you're locked <laughs> i don't have i can't get out of it no holy smokes <laughs> <laughs> so i didn't know all that that came and, and at, know, 16, again, you're, at 16 you're told you you'll never be an artist you'll yeah. never make it <laughs> you'll never make it not good enough <laughs> Uh, okay. So fine. anybody can do this, and you know you're laughing because you say Lorraine, no, they can't. But that's what I really teach. I I teach people to be inspired by um, things that they're passionate about. What are you passionate about? There's yeah. a place for you to do this work. Yeah. So what you do today, there's there's no way you started out doing what you do today. You had to that had to evolve. I have to believe. Did is that is that the is that what happened that you started at some level and and just let it grow from there? I just kept experimenting like a big kid with a box of crayons. I took my professional ability as an illustrator and artist and said, okay, what can I, how can I make this? What am I going to use for that? I mean, if I could use bottle caps, I would. I'm a textile illustrator. That means I'm going to use everything. Now, I pretty much use natural products. You don't see me um, using plastics and things like that, but you'll see me um, – just levitate to something that's going to give me the appearance of a shaggy fetlock or the the hair near the wolf at the top of the crown of the neck. I'm always embellishing and and I do a lot of handwork, hand embroidery and felting and a lot of fiber art that way. And I stitch over wood or soluble. So all of these things, Gary, these aren't webinars or these aren't workshops I took. This is me experimenting in my room and figuring out if I stitch with two different colors of thread through my machine, I can get a blended color that I couldn't get with a, unless I, you know what I mean, unless I stitched over, I can do two at once. So I, it's all these little, exper ex just experimenting. Okay, so you know, I've been told I'm successful because there was no rules. I mm -hmm. didn't have a background. I didn't belong to a guild. Matter of fact, I didn't even know what a guild was. Right, and see, and this, this gets to this question that uh, co-host Beth and I have asked and talked about several times, asking that question, what if? And so you're just doing, you're asking what if time after time after time yeah. to, to experiment and, and see what will work. People say, what do you have? What, you know, what kind of UFOs do you have? I didn't, I didn't even know what a UFO was because I'm so passionate about this that I'm, <laughs> you know, if the wolf came and wants his portrait, I'm doing a wolf. I can't leave his eyebrow hanging off. Like I'm, finishing every project I'm doing and what I know when it's finished people say how long does it take you to do this I stopped counting it's not like I have you know I don't I really put the clock on this that and that's another thing Gary I'm not getting paid by the hour by the minutes but I'm just doing something I'm passionate about and if it happens to sell and uh, helps a nonprofit, great I'm in a good position I you know I'm I know there's a lot of people that think I'm crazy because I give, 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 but don't forget, I'm going back to a white line that said you can never outgive. So what happens? The quilt in Houston calls me. I don't even know who they are. 
to the largest international quilt festival in the world. And they call me and I go, who? I don't even know who they are. <laughs> they asked me to do a 26 piece special exhibit, honestly. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> And, and 26, so that's, that's 26 that's pieces, that's a load. Wow. 26 pieces. And I didn't have, when you know, they do it by square footage, and they're asking me, you know, what are the size of the pieces. So when I started to put all the things together, she said, well, you're short. Do you have any sketches? I said, sure. And I sent her two sketches. They're, we're talking pencil sketches. She said, we want them. Um, my dead, They said, my deadline's July. I said, I'm on my way to Italy to teach Italians how to do this, because now, now I'm people being sought out to teach. America didn't want me. I, I mean, seriously, I didn't. I couldn't get a job in America teaching a fabric collage. The Italians wanted me. The Irish wanted me. Everybody out of the country <laughs> wanted me. So I told them, I said, I'm going to Italy. They were like, well, our deadline's July. I'm like, can you give me September? They said, I'll take September. Well, lo and behold, that piece that I did as a sketch just was on the cover of Quilting Arts magazine. Just, uh -huh. just, it's right, the, right now. It's a current issue. Uh -huh. And so that's how this works. It's like, I, I think that's what I want to tell everybody is, it's not about that. I was never planned on this. And I'm not trying to say that it just fell from the sky. I'm saying you can never outgive. Doors open. Mm -hmm. Doors open. That's what's happening here. I, I didn't even know who. I didn't know Machine Quilting Unlimited. I didn't know PBS had Quilting Arts TV that I was just on three sessions. I didn't know about this. <laughs> so it's, that's, that's the whole thing. And my husband laughs at me. He's like, you, you didn't, he said, you just came out of nowhere. I said, I know, I know. And I have to stop saying I'm new because I'm not new anymore. That was 2016. Right. right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Was four yeah. years later. But for four decades, I was a professional graphic illustrator. And for four years, I'm a textile artist. Yeah. Big difference. <laughs> now, the, the whole collage thing, mm -hmm. which, which you basically create on your own. I mean, there's nobody, mm -hmm. there's nobody to follow. Yeah. Um, uh, I was most fascinated by a couple of things. One is, in, in, in this is just my own personal definition, you're a true artist, a true textile artist, in that it's whatever it takes to create the vision. And machine embroidery, hand embroidery, uh, uh, pieces of fabric. <laughs> in one instance there, you got your husband's old ties. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, all kind, whatever it takes to create the vision. Mm -hmm. And which, uh, you know, you're not locked into one technique at all, which is, is just fascinating to me. But then when in your videos where you're showing how you use the prints in the fabric to create visual lines yes. and, and to lead the eye through your piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, of course, obviously you're a graphic artist. You, you know how that all functions. But to do it with pieces of, of cloth, with printed cloth, is a, is a different level that uh, that comes to you slowly or is that did you see that right away i guess i saw it right away because i'm trying to as i teach people to do this i'm trying to teach them you can use you can i have a purple and yellow horse right now in my studio you can use any color of the rainbow you can use any um shapes i don't use that I don't use that um, gr that system where it's uh, zone one, two, three. I don't do any of the zone stuff. What <laughs> I look at is I'm looking at the photo resource because I have to have photo resource, which I'm blessed to have so many wild horse and wild life um, enthusiasts. Some are, some are on the cover of National Geographic who have contacted me and said, you can have any photo you want. Mm. So I'm so I meditate. I see the animal and then I got to go for photo resources to give me the accuracy. So now we come into, OK, now how am I going to build that jaw or that line? I'm looking at fabrics that spring out to me and say, oh, this will work great to imply that. That's what I'm doing. I'm an impressionist. I'm implying this ridge or this part of the anatomy. And I teach my students not to make Gumby horses, Gumby lions, Gumby anything. I want it to be anatomically correct you right. can have fun 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 graphic fabrics and prints but let's get the anatomy right and then the eye will fill in the rest the eye will fill in the rest yeah well and see that's the that's the fun part because you're you're i mean we talk about thread painting uh mm -hmm. all manner of things and you're you're painting you're using fabric prints as mm -hmm. your as your drawing tool exactly exactly I know people like Free Spirit right now I'm designing my next line of fabrics, which comes out next year. And they're saying, well, what fabric collage do you have in mind? And, and I said, when I have the fabrics in front of me and I can cut them up and place them is when I do the fabric collage. I don't, I don't plan things out. I don't say, 
give me those eight fabrics and and nail. I mean, I can I can literally go into any fabric shop and they can put down you know a dozen or twenty fabrics and I mean I will make you a fabric flush. But my point is is that I'm inspired and then I take the fabrics into my studio and I say okay let's get to work. But I can't I can't create a pattern for you out of these you know nine fabrics. That, that's not how I work. It's too that's too mathematical. I don't do math. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, you talk about, you, you know, we're not making Gumby here uh, mm. because cause your horses in, in particular, I mean, those are the ones I studied the most. Your horses are, I mean, they look like horses. They look and feel like three-dimensional horses and you can see the musculature in them. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated mm -hmm. also by the work you do with your husband with comics. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and your statement about using that illustrative technique to mm. emphasize the the uh, the anatomy that um, it, it it's it's amazing yeah. to me where the different components come from and then make up what you create. Well, that's that's interesting too. So that's what people of all walks of life. So what have you experienced? Where are you in your experience? Um, I just take everything from my experience and place it into my art. For example, I'm working in comics. It's archival newspaper comics, Flash Gordon. This is Alex Raymond. He, I didn't know who Alex Raymond was until I started doing this work. But I'm finding that these were the masters, Gary. These were the guys that could get the best uh, table in a restaurant. This is the time before the Internet. Before, I mean, there was movies. There wasn't even TV. And these guys were the heroes. I mean, these were the big guys. And they, they just amazing, incredible artwork. Well, here I am working all these years later. They're, they're dead and gone. They've passed on. And I'm helping my husband restore these images. And we're talking about collectors that have them in attics. They're rotting newspapers, whatever. And we are collecting and putting an archival uh, news, newspaper. Uh, so you would read from 1914, you know, 1923. It's all collective day by day. And so I'm studying this and I'm going, oh, they're able to imply these shadows and this striking uh, exaggeration of an expression just by doing this with a pen or just adding this. And I use it in my work. I was influenced and I thank them. I thank them. They have, they have helped me to understand how to get the most exaggeration for this impressionistic style that I'm doing. So I, I do, I thank them for my, I, I think they have influenced my work tremendously. So what they're doing with pen and ink, then you you see that and translate that to yep. fabric. Exactly, exactly. And achieve the same thing. Yep. yep. I do it in my fabric design with Free Spirits and I do it in my uh, illustrative work that you see in textile arts. I'm always exaggerating and giving that extra pop. If, if, you're, if you're not careful, if you're not careful, suddenly the fox looks like it's scared because you put too much white in the eye. Right. And see, I, I was going you know, to say, I was going to say that yet yeah, you, you exaggerate, but you know when to stop. I know when to pull back. Yeah. 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 That's fun. And I know that a lot of the students, they want to get to that part. You know, like they want to put all those bells and whistles up. I'm like, you have to learn how to walk first. Really? Seriously. You need to figure out how to get this done without it puckering. You know, there's, <laughs> there's simple things that you have to learn <laughs> the fundamentals here, you know? Yep. What keeps you from being a hoarder? You must need to have a ton of material sitting around to draw from. What keeps me from being a hoarder? <laughs> I could just see piles. That's all I see. My husband, it's so funny. When I first started, it was all felt and fiber, and I had all different you know, tusks of silk and sari silk. I had all kinds of stuff. So to this day, anything that comes to me, I'll say, you got some more fuzz. <laughs> it could be, you know, it could be fabric. It could be anything. I think one of the things I did when I first started this out was that I didn't know I didn't know one designer from the next. I just know what I liked, but I started to feel that some of the less quality fabrics shredded under my needle, you know. So I couldn't go to the box store to buy fabrics because I needed to go to a mm -hmm. local quilt shop because I found that some of the fabrics weren't doing what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. I have students when I teach them, they bring me upholstery fabric and they bring me um, batiks. I can't, sh I, I have a really hard time showing you how to do blending techniques when you bring me a solid. I don't use them. You'll, if you look in my work, you won't see solids because um, I'm using the prints and the colors brought in all the different colors to blend with thread so that it's almost like I'm painting with a watercolor. I'm, I'm, I, it's like doing a watercolor with fabric. So my hardest, my hardest part is when a person comes to me and says, Lorraine, this is all I have. And it's like, brown checks and it's upholstery fabric or whatever, and I got to make something out of it. Right. And, uh, yeah. So but about being a hoarder, I don't, I don't call myself a hoarder. I've collected <laughs> some fabric. My sister's a really good quilter. So we, we send each other fabric. Okay. All the time. 
<laughs> I was just, I was just yanking your chain because you can, I mean, you can see how it'd be hard with what you do. It would be hard to turn down, like to go to a thrift shop, uh, it would be like a gold mine to you. And it would be hard wow. to not walk out of there with a trunk full of I, stuff. I am always in antique stores and I love to work with uh, linens and tablecloths and hankies and doilies. And uh, it's in all of my work. I just, I, I, I don't know, Gary, it just gives it so much more meaning to me. There's like, a, this is a people, places, uh, lives, history of, of yesteryear. And if I can put them into art and help endangered animals with that, it's just, I don't know. It just feels like I'm, I'm connecting with another generation. Yeah. Well, it's neat. Now, now as you're making these things, do, does your mind carry the connection with the horses? Uh, is, is there, does it stay with you while you're creating? Uh, does well, it that's end? a little, that's a little woo woo, Gary. You really okay. want the woo woo answer? No, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. I had to do a, a dog and the dog never was brushed in its life. It's just, it was always in burl, you know, and leaves and twigs and all that stuff. And I'm creating this dog and I'm using fibers and there's leaves and twigs and whatever. And I'm trying, and I, that's not how I work. So I'm cleaning it out. And I hear the dog say to me, I, you know, I hate to be brushed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first time that ever happened that I was like, oh, okay, now the art is talking to me. <laughs> but what happens is I was connecting through her photograph, and that's how I connect with animals. That's that's one of the things I help with people worldwide. I'm, I work with people in Australia. Just send me a photograph of the animal. I connect through the heart energy, and I'm able to communicate with the animal. So that's when the, the work starts to really starts to work me if I'm I'm working on a particular illustration and I'm using a photograph that a photographer allowed me to use here I think I'm doing a zebra but I'm really connecting to that zebra you know what I mean in the photo yeah. and I'm just trying to I'm just trying to get this you know image done so and and, and so there must be some personality that comes through from the mm -hmm. animal each one with its own yeah yeah I did a black panther and the black panther came to me and it's the first time I'd ever had an animal because I say when I go into meditation I say if there's an animal that wishes to have their portrait and has a message for humanity please step forward and so often the animals come sometimes they don't but sometimes I get many and they line up and I had this black panther come to me and I saw it and it was pacing and it was sad and it was upset and I felt my whole body like get so upset because I never really had an animal this um, come to me in meditation like this. And it showed me the Africa, the Amazon rainforest and I saw it in its natural surroundings. And then I saw it in captivity, it kept showing me back and forth, back and forth. And then a word came and it said trapped. Uh -huh. And I knew this animal had been poached. I mean, that's what happens to these animals. And so before I always ask for a closing before they leave, I promised the cat that I would put it in its natural environment when I did its portrait. And I said, um, is there anything new, anything else you'd like to say? And it just said Cambodia. And that was my way of knowing where the cat was. But what is that? So how does that help, Gary? I can't help the animal. He's obviously in captivity, but I can get the message out that this is happening and help the sanctuaries that are rescuing these animals. That's the best I can do. Yeah. But but that that story informs what you create. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where that's where it comes from. And that's why it's an honor. I'm trying to bring honor and, and uh, to bring this this black cat this black panther i i made a promise to him there was a there was a piece i did called a promise kept it was in houston uh, last year whenever they had their last quilt exhibit and it was called a promise cat and i did that white line that first white line that told me i could never outgive and um that piece that was so funny because that's another thing gary i wasn't used to having my work sold and having red dots on it and when i came back down and i said to my husband people are putting red dots on my work what is this red <laughs> what's this red dots because we sold 11 pieces like in, I don't know, three of them sold before the show even opened. Oh my. Crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. And is that hard to, to create these things given what you go through to develop them, to see them go yeah. away or is it heartwarming? It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Okay. I, I know that people don't understand. A lot of people go, Lorraine, how could you part with that? I'm like, you know, it's, it was meant to go there. And I always believe that. And there's pieces on, I never fret. I, I used to get all, I used to get all upset. I'm like, this, why isn't this piece selling? And then son of a gun, if I don't get an email, is this piece still available? So it's a timing thing. It just wasn't meant to go then. It'll go. Don't mm -hmm. go. 
When the time is right, they'll all go. Okay, so that that is part of the giving. Yes. Okay. Because, yes. see, I would find it to, to go through what you go through to create a piece and then have somebody buy it and walk away with it would just kind of tear at me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. I, I, I only have so much wall space here, Gary. I'm in a condo. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so as as a result of this, you do not lack for inspiration for the next piece. Never. You have a parade of it. And that's why I try to talk to people about finding your passion. You don't have to become a meditator like I am. But if it's something that you absolutely love to do, connect to the energy of that passion and head to your studio and just keep that energy with you. That work that you do needs that energy to follow it through or it will become a UFO. So you have to connect to why you're doing it and stay there with it and follow it through. I know life gets in the way. I know that we can't all, I know you sometimes start a project and say, I don't like it anymore. I get all that. But but that energy has to land somewhere. So if you tear it apart, put it into something else. I mean, just I just try to connect people to what makes their heart sing. What makes your heart sing? If it's cooking or gardening, whatever it is, find a way to put it into your work. These, I mean, I've got them, and you know about this, Gary. I've got people that take webinars and workshops from one to the next, just going here and there. And, and I, you know. God bless them. That's great. And I know teachers appreciate that because that's what their bread and butter is. But I'm trying to teach them to step away from all of that. Take what you've learned. Don't stop going to webinars and YouTube and whatever, but take the time to pause in the silence and connect into everything you've learned and put your work out, put your signature on it so that you're not just copying what some teacher gave you. Mm -hmm. Be you. Be you. That's that's, there's no other message I can give to people. I mean, that's it. Just be you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's hard to do. It's a big leap for a lot of people. It really is. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, yeah. All right, so through all of this, you become a Bernina ambassador. You're doing work with Aurifil threads, and then you have these these free spirit fabric lines. How does that all happen? I mean, that that's uh, kind of just like this other sidetrack. You have you have so many, <laughs> so many sidetracks in your career. Uh, I know, and you know, it's so funny. When I was first getting into art, I sat down. I wanted to be a children's illustrator, and I had this art rep. She's from New York, and I'm living in South Jersey. And she says, "Well, you're very talented, but you're wearing too many hats. And you, first of all, if you're going to work for me, you have to move to Manhattan." And I'm like, I got to move to New York to be a children's illustrator? Forget it. <laughs> but I was told back then I was wearing too many hats. So years later, I'm trying to do a video for self-promotion so I can explain to people what I do. And the video videographer says, Lorraine, you're wearing too many hats. I'm like, you know what? I'm tired of apologizing for knowing how to do all this stuff. <laughs> So the, the free spirit and the um, RFL thread, RFL thread, they did a three part blog on me. And that was like a, that was like a natural step in that direction to become an RFL designer because I use all RFL. I mean, they have 270 colors. And, you know, before I became an RFL artisan, I was using them. So, you know, it was a natural, uh, yeah. natural, natural relationship there. As far as free spirit, that was pretty cool. I was in Houston and I met with some different people that, you know, this person said, what machine are you using? I said, I'm, I use a Bernina. Have you talked to Bernina? No, I haven't talked to Bernina. Oh, I'm going to talk to him for you. What What's that going to do for me? And I, I really didn't know what that all meant because, I'm again, I'm new to this. I'm just trying to help animals, Gary. This is what That's I'm right. doing. I'm right. just trying yeah. to help animals. And I get this phone call from this uh, woman, and she said, are you sitting down? I was like, I guess. <laughs> she said, uh, we have decided to make you a Bernina ambassador, and we're putting a Q20 in your house. And bringing a long arm Q20 arrived like, I don't know, a month later. And uh, that's how that happened. So Okay. All right. Now, I, I'm absolutely clueless. I have a cheap brother sewing machine that I use <laughs> to edge linen. So when you become a Bernina ambassador and they put a Q20 long arm, I assume that's a quilting machine. Yeah, what? it's a it's a 20. So when you see my work, if you're going to be rolling it up, like I had like you have, I have a domestic machine that had a small throat. That's called the throat, that bed. And rolling up and trying to do my thread painting and my my fiber art that I'm doing, it was it was becoming more of a challenge. And so Bernina obviously wants me to show the people that follow me how I do my work. And uh. so by giving me, you know, the Cadillac of their machines, I'm able to 
know, help promote this machine. And it is, it really is a workhorse and I love it. And I, I can talk about it from my heart, not just as a spokesman for Bernina. I absolutely am nuts about this machine. It's fantastic. So all of these things literally just come to you. It's not, you didn't seek them out. There you, you go, just, doors open. You're, yeah. just, you're just quietly doing your art. <laughs> I went to see Free Spirit. I was doing my 26-piece exhibit in Houston in 2018, and I had I made an appointment with Free Spirit because I wanted to get free fabric because I'm doing so much, and I'm using a lot of Free Spirit. Yeah. And um, they said to me, how would you like to be a fabric designer? And I said, I, I, okay, because <laughs> I never did that before. And I realized that there you go, Gary, another door is opening. I didn't ask to be a Free Spirit. I wanted some fabric. So... <laughs> They say, let's take a look at your work. And they went over to look at my exhibit. And then she said to me, how many other appointments, how many other fabric companies are you meeting with? And I said to her, none. She said, you don't have a plan B? I said, you don't understand. I am a free spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, what happened. that's how that went down. And so they signed me. And uh, I've been working for free spirit since 2018. So, and, and that is an annual line of fabrics that you create? Yeah, everybody comes out, different designers, they might bring them out, like the big guns, I'll bring them out, you know, spring and fall and whatever, and I'm just do one a year, that's enough for me, Gary, because it's in, intense work, because I am meditating and bringing the line to you what is coming to me, so it's not just, just oh, I think I'm going to do ducks, it's a process of, like the first one was all the calico horses and all the elements of what goes into the wild horses, everything. And the next one was called migration. So all the animals that migrate came to, came alive. And that just is in stores now. That just was released, migration. And uh, and that's another thing. So I earmark everything I do to help endangered animals. So the first line went to horselink.org, which helps uh, – it helps veterans that come back with post-traumatic stress. It helps seniors that feel like they don't have a job anymore. They don't have their purpose anymore. And they team them up with champion retired uh, show horses. And that's called horse link. So that, that fabric went to help them. Migration went to help the Marine Animal Response Society, which cuts the whales out of the nets, the ones that are caught in the fishermen. So these are all the things that people don't really, you know, they don't really have to know. But these are the things that I do with the uh, fabrics and threads that come out. I see that that's uh, that's so neat that because everything has that second layer of meaning to it. It's all connected. Yeah, it's all connected. Yeah, and and then you said you uh, have a design that's coming out next year, so all of that is being that process is taking a year plus then to create. Oh each sure. Line. Yeah. Sure. I do intense work with that, and I can't do any of my textile illustration while I'm doing that because it's like I have my graphic design hat on while I'm doing that. And that's tough for me, Gary, because I absolutely love having my hand in fiber all the time. You can ask my husband. It's like I have to, like a shark swimming. I'm, uh, And I've been told I'm a prolific artist. I am a prolific artist. I turn this stuff out pretty quick. But it's because I said they're coming to me and they're lined up. And I'm like, okay, I got to do a jaguar soon because it keeps coming in meditation. That's, why it, that's the yeah. way it works. Yeah. I love I love that being chastised for wearing too many hats because yeah. one one of the things that I believe about needlework in the, in the greater you know the greater definition, but uh, just for what, what I do is you know cross stitch embroidery needlepoint uh, those mm. kinds of things is that you know so the people will say you should lock in on one technique and get good at it. And, yep. and yeah, you can make a case for that, but I think you can also make a case for doing multiple techniques because you learn from each. And I think overall you get better. I think you do too. And it gives you that. What I, when I think of um, reading a book that you read 10 years ago and you go, you know what? I, I have a totally different, it's your perspective, Gary. It's your life experience. And now your perspective is different. So you start out and you're doing your needlepoint this way, or you're doing cruel or whatever, whatever that really you love doing. And you start to add something, something different to it. And you realize what you've been missing, right? You're like, I didn't know this. I could do this. This is so much yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's uh, that's uh, the needlework is one of the r rare hobbies where you can learn from all aspects and all different techniques and get better uh, around you know uh, at all levels. I, I really I always believe that that <clears throat> if I do some black work and and that I'm going to learn something that will help me with needlepoint, 
uh, yes. whether it be yes. tension or thickness mm-hmm. of thread or how it behaves mm-hmm. or whatever. And I'm sure that when you extend to what you do, making collages, embroidery with a machine, that that yeah. same kind of thing happens. Yes. And, you know, going back to the doors opening, I was, again, experimenting with my different flosses. So I'm doing embroidery and I'm trying different things and I'm not I'm not really, uh, ed- you know, like I'm not experienced like you. So I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just seeing what I like and what feels right. And this one seems to tangle. Oh, let me get some thread heaven and try that. And that that might make make it work better. And then this woman from Australia sees my work and says, we want, we want to send you our dyed silk flosses, whatever. And so they send me <laughs> this huge package and now I use color streams from, from Australia. And it's just another door that opened, but I absolutely love her products. And now I'm hooked, you know, now I'm hooked on this. And it's a way, I guess that's the whole giving back, right? So now I use her products and the people that follow me see her products. And I guess that's the way it goes. But I absolutely love to experiment. So I would never would have known about these products unless I just said, you know, let me, let me, just let me see if this is going to work. And I don't know. Let's just try it. Yeah. Yeah. Just see. What if? Just let's just see. What if you're right? What if? What if? Yep. Lorraine, thank you. This has been a, this has been an absolute treat. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for making the time. Thank you, Gary. It was my, my pleasure. All right. And thanks to everyone for listening. (laughs) 